I'm Mark Skidmore. I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the webinar is titled uh, Fiscal Stress After the Great Recession, a study of rural counties in the U.S. Um, the two lead researchers on this project were Dr. Biswa Das, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Community and Regional Planning at Iowa State University, and Dr. John Leatherman, who's a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. Um, and they've done a, 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 well, actually I was a part of this uh, work as well, but we've been working for a, a while now trying to assess what is happening with uh, rural counties in the United States following the, 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 the years following the Great Recession. And so with that introduction, I'd like to pass it on to John, who will be uh, uh, doing the webinar today. John, thanks again for um, coming and, uh, and, and doing the webinar. Well, uh, thank you, Mark, for uh, your assistance in the entire project. Unfortunately, Biswa Das is unable to join us today, so I'll just do the best that I can on my own. I'd also, though, like to acknowledge our other partners on this product, uh, project, including Judy Stallman from the University of Missouri, Columbia, Craig Maher from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, uh, Mark Skidmore, of course, and Bonnie Bressers from Kansas State University. <clears throat> I'd also like to acknowledge our project sponsor, the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, who has uh, supported this work over some period of time and uh, supported the development of a large research proposal that uh, we are hopeful will eventually uh, achieve uh, successful funding. Now, <clears throat> with this work, I'd like to just talk a little bit about some of the motivation behind it. Uh, of course, we're all aware that the Great Recession, 2007 to 9, caused a lot of fiscal challenges for both states and local government. The literature, though, and the research that's been conducted uh, with regard to uh, fiscal conditions since the Great Recession is largely focused on cities and mostly on larger cities. Rural counties have not really received much of any research attention uh, and what we were interested in learning was what were the fiscal conditions in rural America after the end of the Great Recession and since that period of time. And we were also interested in trying to determine whether there were some innovative ways that rural counties in particular were responding to the fiscal challenges that they've, they've faced. Our objectives of the study then were to enhance our understanding of recent county government fiscal condition and management in response to the recession to see the resulting uh, changes in state local government fiscal relations within the context of post-recession fiscal austerity and to focus most closely on the conditions that exist in rural counties. Our study actually involved a survey of state counties association executive directors. We had sort of a two-part research methodology that included an online survey that gathered some objective uh, indications of fiscal uh, conditions that exist. Then we followed that with, a, uh, with direct telephone interviews uh, to our study uh, participants to get more of a qualitative understanding of the situation that exists. In general, we did most of this work between about January and April of 2016. Uh, and uh, we were successful in reaching a fair number of the executive directors and indeed, they had been in their respective positions for a median of about 10 years. And so uh, they had a good deal of experience with regard to their state, their uh, member county fiscal conditions. Uh, currently, there are 54 of these counties associations uh, that are listed on the National Association of Counties website. Uh, in response to the online component, of our survey, we had uh, about a 36% response rate looking at the various census regions and the representation geographically, seven from Western states, five from the Midwest, four from the South and two from the uh, Northeast. For the telephone interview component, we had about a 40% response rate. 
Overall, we had about a 54% response rate uh, with executive directors responding to one or both of our survey uh, initiatives, and they represented approximately 63% of the counties in the United States. So we feel as though we had a fair representation of what's going on in, uh, in rural counties in the United States. First, with regard to our online survey, we asked a number of questions with regard to the status of revenues since the Great Recession. And we asked uh, what has happened with property tax revenue since the end of the recession. And in general, there has been a slight increase in property tax revenue collections. There's been a more substantial increase in fees, licenses, transfers, etc. cetera. Uh, sales tax, of course, isn't applicable in some states, but where it is applicable, it was about evenly split between those who viewed that revenue source as increasing or declining. Tax delinquencies have increased since the Great Recession, but home foreclosures have stabilized and remained stable since then. In asking questions with regard to rural population change, the large majority indicated that the rural populations were continuing to decline. We asked about the outlook uh, post-survey uh, in 2017 and beyond, and we asked what did the executive directors believe would happen with property tax rates. In general, they saw that property tax rates were likely to increase somewhat, uh, sales tax rates were likely to increase, and more than half indicated that fees and licenses, they anticipated a, a somewhat more substantial increase. We wanted to ask some questions with regard to intergovernmental aids and intergovernmental relations, and with regard to federal aids, the executive director indicated that in general, they remained fairly stable or declined since the Great Recession. In the vast majority of states who responded to our survey, state aids have declined since the Great Recession. Uh, in questions regarding debt levels, about half said that there had been no uh, substantial change in the levels of debt that uh, county governments had incurred, although six indicated that there was something of an increase in the level of debt that counties were carrying. Uh, with regard to new debt incurred, uh, it was generally fairly stable to somewhat increase. We asked what was happening with uh, infrastructure spending, and the majority had witnessed a, an increase in the backlog of infrastructure needs that counties had. We asked what strategies they had been employing to manage their spending, and indeed uh, we observed that the level of public employment in county government had declined somewhat, that the wages of county employees had increased somewhat, that there was an increased use of privatization as a strategy for service provision, that uh, their funding of, of pensions uh, at the county level had remained about the same, but there had been substantial increases in both the cost of employee benefits as well as retired employee benefits. We asked what they th saw as the outlook for management strategies, and they saw that there would, they anticipated an increase in their levels of human services funding, that there were, that they anticipated an increase in interlocal cooperation among local governments for service provision, uh, that they anticipated that the level of employment would remain fairly stable going into the future, uh, that wages were likely to increase somewhat, and they anticipated very substantial increases in both uh, the employee share of health care premiums that they would be expected to pay, as well as uh, a, a, an increased reliance on general fund balances as they tried to build up some bit of reserves uh, in anticipation of future needs. Turning then to the telephone interviews that we conducted and the qualitative portion of our research initiative, we have to first of all acknowledge the fact that we spoke 
with county association executive directors. And so we're really only getting uh, the county side of the story. And if we recognize that counties associations are primarily advocacy organizations, it might be unsurprising that perhaps uh, these executive directors uh, were a bit uh, uh, defensive on behalf of their membership, if you will. Uh, but once again, there is no corresponding uh, organization that can offer a perspective on our questions at the state level. The state, the state governments association really is an advocacy organization to the U.S. Congress. And there is no unified voice that sort of talks about state local relations on behalf of all the counties. And so once again, we have to acknowledge that we're only telling one side of the story here when we talk about these kind of qualitative perspectives that the executive directors had offered. But nonetheless, we see it as a valuable perspective to understand and hope that in presenting the information, it can, it can stimulate something of a dialogue about the status of state local fiscal relations that exist. We ask them about uh, state policies that helped or hindered uh, fiscal conditions. We asked about issues facing rural counties and whether or not there were any innovative response strategies that rural counties were employing in response to their fiscal challenges. Uh, at the time we were conducting uh, these interviews, most states, it was the springtime, most states were in legislative session and it was really tough trying to hook up with these people to, to talk. But when we did, in general, we were able to reach the executive director and our interviews lasted anywhere from 20 minutes to well over an hour in some, in some cases. First, we asked about policies that were negatively impacting uh, counties in general. And I would say that overall, we would have to characterize there being a sense of a general disconnect between state legislators and local legislators. There's a strong sense that state legislators do not understand the local situation, nor trust local legislators to be able to deal with it responsibly. Uh, we observed that uh, there was indeed something of a residual uh, effect associated with the economic recession. What most states did at that time was to dramatically cut state aids to local government. And since that time, many of them have never been restored and counties feel as though they've never been made whole from uh, the, the burden that they were forced to carry in helping to manage state budgets. Uh, there was a general sense that there was a lack of local control that states were constraining their ability to respond to their needs or otherwise compelling them to take actions. Uh, and of course, with regard to uh, state, uh, tax, or state and local government tax and expenditure limitations, um, the vast majority of them chafe at these uh, limitations as impinging upon local control and constraining local autonomy. Continuing with some of their other concerns with regard to state policies negatively affecting county fiscal conditions, they, are, they uh, complained oftentimes about the unfunded mandates that were forced upon them. They were being compelled to offer new service responsibilities without the concomitant new revenues to cover those. Uh, or alternatively, states were withdrawing assistance without lifting the mandates that, uh, that had been imposed. Uh, they complained quite a little bit in many instances about what they saw as an erosion of their tax base by exempting various classes of property or transactions at the state level for economic or energy development purposes. And that indeed uh, may be the case, although we do need to acknowledge that local governments themselves are more than willing to exempt uh, classes of property when they see it as being in their economic interest. And then we did observe in a number of states that are dependent upon natural resources, particularly 
energy related resources, these periodic boom bust cycles uh, were observed to be uh, particularly challenging uh, in, in turn. Then we asked about the policies that were positively affecting counties. And here again, the executive directors saw very little uh, reason for optimism. Uh, in some instances, there had been some modest revenue enhancements, um, uh, but any significant local government assistance largely had been enacted years before in, in, by way of programs such as city county revenue sharing or local ad valorem tax reduction type policies. Those are legacy policies uh, and really have, have, there's been no substantial assistance since that time. Any aids that have been offered have been very much targeted for such things as transportation assistance, emergency dispatch, or road and bridge repair. Uh, and increasingly, states are turning to one-time funding programs that create a limited pool of resources that, can be made, that they largely make available by competitive application. A couple of states had enacted gas tax increases in light of the lower oil costs. Uh, and in some cases, there was uh, some sharing with local governments. And it, uh, it was acknowledged that in a number of, of energy dependent states, there had been some assistance for rural communities and counties that had been experiencing rapid growth uh, in response to uh, uh, new energy supplies coming online. Then we asked specifically about the challenges that rural counties were facing. And almost across the board, they identified uh, the dearth of economic opportunity and the associated declining population and tax base necessary to support public finances. A couple of fairly insightful executive directors, in my view, talked a bit about the, the leadership uh, gap that is opening up in many rural areas. Uh, what goes along with the out-migration of the population is really the, the effective leadership and volunteerism that's necessary to sustain many of our rural communities was, was harder and harder to fill uh, that gap. Uh, of course, infrastructure is a major issue in many rural areas with aging roads and bridges, water and wastewater facilities and schools. Uh, and all of these types of investments require some type of an external assistance because there just simply aren't the financial resources available at the local level to respond to many of these needs. Uh, with regard to population movement, of course, out-migration in, in many rural areas was a concern. But then again, there are, were pockets where in amenity-rich areas, the in-migration was causing a very serious uh, challenge insofar as it overwhelmed uh, the ability to provide for the infrastructure necessary to support that new population. Uh, service reorganization is a significant challenge that the executive director saw, uh, particularly with trends toward moving toward community-based services for such things as mental health and corrections uh, type assistance. In those states that had foregone Medicaid expansion, that was seen as a very substantial burden given the expansion of, of uh, health-related needs uh, and particularly those relating to mental health uh, and increasing law enforcement needs, uh, particularly as we are keeping uh, more offenders in the community close to home rather than, uh, rather than moving them toward larger institutional facilities. They saw health and education as two challenges in particular with local needs growing in relation to health and mental health growing much faster than the assistance uh, needed to uh, deal with those kinds of problems. And of course, local schools, 
The buildings, equipment, technology are all becoming antiquated, and <clears throat> they saw that as a, a particular fiscal challenge for many rural counties. When asked about the notion of rural innovation, something we were very interested in, uh, to be honest, many were hard pressed to offer any examples of what they viewed as, as innovative responses to fiscal stress that the counties were dealing with. If they identified anything, they generally identified such things as regionalization in areas relating to mental health, economic development, a couple of cases of public health and law enforcement, uh, particularly jail services being uh, provided on a regional level. Uh, there were instances of consolidation and some informal cooperation, uh, particularly uh, targeting emergency dispatch services and solid waste. And what we, we still have ongoing an effort to gather uh, a number of case studies that we would like to be able to feature as being innovative in, uh, on behalf of rural counties uh, facing fiscal challenges. But when you follow up on many of these hopeful uh, 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 references, if you will, there generally tends to be sort of less than meets the eye when you dig right into it in terms of, of how it is saving money or expanding services or offering more effective services. So indeed, to the extent that uh, there is any suggestion as to some uh, instances that we might follow up on, I certainly would welcome uh, any suggestions that any of our participants today uh, might offer. So as we sort of summarize that which we felt we learned through the course of this research initiative, I came away from it with a, 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 a feeling that as a result of the economic stresses that occurred in and around the Great Recession, it had kind of catalyzed a reset of state local government fiscal relations such that they are fundamentally altered today. Uh, and indeed, what we observe is that uh, local government aids and revenue sharing uh, have been substantially curtailed or even eliminated, that there has been a transfer of responsibilities and various unfunded mandates that had occurred, that indeed uh, tax and expenditure limitations are limiting local flexibility and the ability of local officials to respond to uh, needs that they, uh, that they encounter and that local needs and responsibilities are growing overall, especially in relation to health, mental health, community-based services, law enforcement, and infrastructure. And there is no sign that really this distress is going to abate in any substantial way. And sort of coming to that conclusion of my own and going back to the literature, I would point out that there have been other researchers that had been looking at it. And in particular, there was a, a, uh, a seminar that uh, LaPlante and Honadel put together uh, back in uh, 2011, considering uh, the impacts of the Great Recession. And they characterized the circumstance that exists today as the new public finance. And they have uh, asserted that there is a, uh, a permanent change in state local government fiscal relations and indeed focusing principally on conditions at the state level they uh they observe that enduring revenue constraints and the rising liabilities associated with pension and retirement costs coupled with the rising costs of health care the aging of the population and uncertainty over future budget demands uh, has created a circumstance of permanent fiscal stress that will exist at both the state and the local level. And indeed, uh, they had uh, a number of the participants in their, in their seminar had identified a number of, of issues that they felt were, were key to this, uh, this circumstance and, and 
some sense of what needs to be done going forward. And indeed, uh, overall, this sort of pre-recession model of state local public finance, uh, if not broken before, certainly has been severed at this point now. Um, and indeed, the needed changes that uh, we can identify would be exceptionally difficult in the current climate. And there is considerable doubt that we will be able to sort of improve that situation. Some of the suggestions that had been made is the need to take a longer term view of, uh, of, of, of fiscal conditions that exists. Typically, legislators utilize a very short term perspective in response to budget challenges and do short term solutions such as across the board cuts so that everybody shares the pain. Well, generally, that's not terribly effective or smart. Uh, and indeed, the recommendation is, is to focus on long-term cost containment strategies, identifying priorities, and targeting where, where you preserve your, uh, your capacity to support uh, services and where you're going to cut spending. Focusing on sustainability, uh, <clears throat> more sustainable service provision through building reserves in good times to cover the downturns. Uh, instead, what we tend to do when the economy improves is cut taxes. And then we don't know where the money is going to come from when we face that inevitable downturn. There's another element that needs to be acknowledged here, and that is the idea of trying to maintain as much as possible a state of fiscal wellness in good times and in bad. And this is the suggestion of greater use of fiscal indicator systems to try to uh, uh, keep uh, fiscal health uh, in good condition. There needs to be full accounting of needs and obligations. There's much too much focus on the here and now, this fiscal year, this next contract cycle, and how we're going to get to next fiscal year. What we need to do instead is recognize that there are a lot of long-term implications to the choices we make today and we need to maintain a long view to plan for obligations beyond two years or five years or ten years. We would call perhaps for a greater level of local government flexibility uh, and this indeed is to give local officials greater not lesser uh, autonomy in responding to the needs that they exist and in general we find that they are really quite responsible in meeting their, uh, their, their needs and their obligations. Uh, one would question whether or not some type of local government structural reform might be called for. We have to really question whether 90,000 plus local government units is as efficient as needed uh, here in the United States. And some states are indeed looking at uh, at, at the number of, of local units of government. Uh, public employee pension reforms are probably going to be needed uh, because I don't know that states and local governments can continue to take on these obligations over the long term. But to me, that really begs the question about how we are providing for retirement income and health care uh, in this country going into the future. And then finally, we perhaps would need to expand constituencies for what we would consider public goods. And I'm not suggesting privatization, but really we may have to look to community groups, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to help fill some of the gaps in local government service provision. The suggestion here is to expand the pool of public equity holders with greater reliance on, on public-private partnerships to leverage the scarce public resources that we have available. Now, if you're interested, you can uh, find our full uh, report uh, here at this U URL. Uh, Rosa tells me that actually, if you just simply click on uh, the link provided right here, it'll take you right to that document. Uh, but you will find that available and of course the presentation will be uh, posted online at the, uh, at the North Central Regional Center. 
And then finally, if you'd like to uh, visit with us about uh, the project, or if you have any ideas or suggestions that you'd like to offer in terms of following up on the work that's been conducted here, here is the contact information for both myself as well as Biswa Das, and we would welcome any kind of inquiry, any kind of suggestion, any, any reactions you may have. And so with that, uh, I would just uh, invite any kind of, of questions that you may have, and we'll try to answer them as best as I can. Well, thanks, John. Uh, for those uh, of you who have a question or would like to make a comment, you can use the, char uh, the chat feature down below here, um, and you can just type in uh, your comment or question. Um, John, I, I was, uh, you know, as part of this, um, but I, I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe differences in places where there is a uh, population growing in those amenity-rich places versus the population decline. I know there are some differences. Um, did even those places that had uh, some growth because of the amenity context and everything, they were also experiencing stress in, in to what degree relative to those in decline? Well, indeed, uh, there were uh, a number of instances of high amenity uh, uh, areas such as the coastal area of North uh, of, uh, North Carolina, I recall that specifically, where they had indicated that there was such rapid growth in areas that were ill-prepared in many instances to accept that growth that they were having difficulty uh, providing for, for wastewater treatment and other kinds of infrastructure facilities to support that influx of population. And indeed, those places uh, were hard pressed given the, the substantial nature of the investments that are necessary to accommodate uh, that kind of, of growth. And so I think that uh, while the nature of the stressors were quite different, uh, in terms of those places experiencing out migration that perhaps did not have the amenities uh, with, with kind of the aging of the infrastructure and the, the, the perhaps decline and failure of some of their facilities versus those who needed to make very substantial new investments. Nonetheless, there is stress on both on both ends of that spectrum. I don't see any uh, comments coming in on the chat section here, or uh, the chat feature. How about, uh, you know, I, I know that you're painting an overall picture, and this is a perspective provided by the uh, Association of Counties in the various states. Um, so they're providing big picture. Were there were there uh, some examples of of you know bright spots that seem to be getting it just about right, um, or is it is, you know? Is it really that we're all experiencing the same kind of challenges? Well, um, we actually uh, uh, have as one of our objectives this notion of trying to ferret out uh, some <clears throat> kind of good news stories, if you will, by way of our, our case studies. And indeed, we do see um, a number of instances where, uh, you know, local communities are rising uh, to the challenge that, uh, that uh, they face. And I can speak to personal experience right here in my own home county where I believe that there is sort of effective interlocal cooperation to respond to a number of challenges that exist in relation to health, mental health, law enforcement. Um, and so th there are, I think, instances of good uh, news. I, I, I suspect to some extent, just given kind of the, uh, 
nature of the discussion overall that many of the executive directors indeed found themselves hard pressed to be terribly optimistic given what they perceived as, as the overall challenges that their member counties were, were undertaking. Uh, so, uh, in, in, indeed, I, I do welcome uh, suggestions of, uh, of, of local uh, counties and municipalities uh, in successfully dealing with the challenges that exist. But again, oftentimes, uh, once you sort of dig in under the surface, uh, you know, there's, as I characterized earlier, perhaps a bit less than meets the eye in so far as, you know, there, there are some interesting stories, but do they save a lot of money? Generally, no. Do they uh, expand service provision or offer more, more effective services? Generally, only marginally. And so uh, we are sort of still on the hunt. And I had hoped as one of the outcomes of this project that we would be able to put together uh, some type of a, a publication that would feature and highlight a number of these ideas. But what we're looking for are things that are kind of responses to the current challenges that exist. And in particular, we're interested in, in things that smaller and rural communities can, can do on their own behalf. And so uh, those are the kind of good news stories we continue to try to ferret out. Right. Um, uh, last year I had um, a, a speaker from Strong Towns and um, the, I guess the message from his organization was is that that um, oftentimes uh, communities expand the infrastructure and expand, uh, um, you know, based on the access to finding resources to pay for that infrastructure. And then you have so much that we don't take into account um, the fact that we have to replace it at some point and that this creates a, a, a long run stressor and that, that really the way we design our, our places um, are le is leading to what you are observing, you know, here in your study, and that maybe there are some places that didn't expand in that same way and didn't overextend without thinking about the implications down the road. And so they're doing a, um, a kind of a competition right now to look to identify places that are sustainable and how they've developed over time. So that's uh, something to look into as well. That's called Strong Towns. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, uh, John. Well, it sort of harkens back to the suggestion that uh, um, I had seen and offered a little bit earlier about the need for full accounting of the needs and obligations that uh, uh, a municipality incurs in, in making decisions. And that may be in relation to uh, uh, such things as, as as pensions and employee benefits, as well as as uh, the maintenance of essential infrastructure, uh, and that is to say that we need to have a perspective that extends beyond just two, five, or ten years, and uh, consider that there are long-term implications of the decisions that we are making today. Right. I see John has a John Amrine has a comment here. While you're reviewing that, John, uh, Rosa has provided the link to the Strong Towns website for those who are interested. Well, uh, I hope that you find the information contained within uh, our, our paper to be uh, useful. Um, we are working on sort of a a, a, a shorter, more condensed version of the paper that we would hope uh, will find a home for publication. And uh, when, we've, uh, when we've got that uh, in a condition that we can share, we will certainly make that available as well. 
Well, good. Thanks so much, John, for um, pulling all of this information together for us. And um, we'll have um, this webinar recorded and um, available uh, via YouTube here coming soon as well. So you, um, you can share it. We'll share that broadly, too. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. And I hope you all have a productive rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks again, John. Thank you.